Morning, thanks all for coming. Uh, what I'm gonna do over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is talk a little bit about some of the agents that we use for kidney cancer, and then talk a bit about some of the ones that we uh, are using in the front line. Some of these agents that are approved in the front line setting, and one agent that's kind of coming down the pipeline in the front line agent. I think it's important for us to talk first about how do these drugs work, and I know that Many of you are, are seasoned um, uh, patients and you've heard this stuff before, but I think it's always good to review. So there's really three major classes of drugs that we use for kidney cancer. The first is a blood vessel starving or anti-angiogenic drug, of which we have a number that are approved. Sutent and Votrient are very good examples of it. Cabometics um, is, is also a, uh, an example of it. <clears throat> And um, the second major class, which you're gonna be hearing about from, from Dr. Gao, are, are the immune modulating drugs. And there is the old fashioned one, high dose interleukin-2 or proleukin. And then there's the new fashioned one, an example of which is nivolumab or Updevo. And the third are mTOR inhibitors, a mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors. And when we are treating cancer, increasingly we're realizing that what we're doing is we're treating an organ. We're not treating just the cancer cells. Actually, for the large part, we're really bad at targeting the cancer cells directly. And so a lot of the treatments that we use are either just kind of tickling the cancer cell uh, and slowing it down but not killing it, or working indirectly through other cells which can, uh, either, we can either decrease their function or we can increase their function. So these anti-angiogenic or blood vessel starving agents do exactly what the, those words sound like. They will actually target those blood vessels. In a cancer, blood vessel cells themselves are actually not cancerous. They're normal cells. They don't have mutations, generally speaking. But what they are is there are new blood vessels that have been generated that are, are young and immature and are addicted to factors that the tumors are actually producing. So because they're addicted to this and they're more vulnerable, if you block that, then you can actually damage those blood vessels and not the normal blood vessels in our body for the large part, which is why these drugs actually work. Because otherwise, you know, if we were going to be using blood vessel starving therapies and you know, our aorta and our veins and arteries and the normal parts of our body were to break down, this would not be very therapeutic. But because it's affecting the blood vessels of the cancer, the tumor organ itself, then uh, we, are, we are targeting that. And so these tumors, as they grow, one cell, four cell, eight cell, 16, et cetera, when they're really small, you can actually get nutrients to the middle of the tumor without any major problems. But as they grow beyond a certain size, you can't get the nutrients in the middle anymore, and that's when these blood vessels start forming. Okay? So in that regard, these therapies probably only work when there are blood vessels in the tumor. So just micrometastatic or, or one circulating tumor cell or one tumor cell that's lodged somewhere in, in, a, in a lung or, or other organ in the body probably won't work that well. But once you have those blood vessels, it'll work better. So the immune agents that Dr. Gao is going to be talking to you about, they work um, rather differently. So we've known for the longest time that kidney cancer is an immune responsive uh, 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 cancer where in some cases we see spontaneous shrinkage, we've seen that interferon and interleukin-2 kind of work, but they don't work as well as we want. And part of the reasons why is because our immune system, as you're gonna be hearing, has a set of checks and balances. You probably know of or have heard of or have friends and uh, family members who have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Those are examples of our immune system run amok. And so we don't want that either. We don't want our immune system to be overactive well, we don't want it to be underactive either. So the therapies that Dr. Gowering is going to talk about, they actually will help the T cells, the immune cells that are sort of in between the blood vessels and the tumor cells, to wake up, recognize the cancer cell, and eat and kill the cancer cell directly. The third class of drugs are the mTOR inhibitors. And these are, um, if, the, if the cancer cells themselves are a runaway bus with, uh, with the gas pedal um, on uh, full, what they do is they basically take the foot off the gas pedal and they slow down the bus, but they don't actually stop the bus or um, uh, you know, bring it to a halt. 
it slows down the rate of change. So they're, they're probably the weakest agent of the, of the three, although there is a subset of a small percentage of individuals who derive major benefit from these. So that's sort of a little bit of a background of the different classes of drugs we're using. Um, the, the one that's most exciting really and where there's the largest growth are in the immune uh, uh, therapies and there's a far more immune therapies out there now already than we can even design clinical trials for. And that means that we're going to have to think differently about how we design clinical trials in the future. Because now what we're doing, it's basically we design a clinical trial around, a, you know, let's think, imagine a pill, and it's surrounded by a whole bunch of people, and we're basically trying to apply a whole bunch of people to that one pill well, or in, a drug. In the future, when we get smart enough, we can characterize an individual's tumor better. We will then take that patient and essentially do experiments with saying, all right, characterize the tumor and then come up with therapies that are, that are really personalized and specific to that person's tumor. And as the tumor changes, because it's always trying to escape what we're doing, we can then alter in a smart way the therapies that we're applying. That hopefully is going to be the way we treat people 10 years from now. So again, without taking away from Dr. Gao, I'm sure he's going to show far more beautiful slides than this. Um, I'll skip these just so that um, I, don't, I don't steal his thunder. A couple of definitions. Uh, nephrectomy is, as you've heard, removal of a kidney. Adjuvant therapy is therapy that we give after we don't see any evidence of cancer, like after a surgical removal, after the nephrectomy. Metastatic is stage four, when you've had spread to other organs in the body. Randomized trials mean that basically you have a study where you have a bunch of people and you then basically divide them into two or three or whatever. You divide them into these two groups, and then you let a computer flip a coin and decide which drug um, one group gets versus the other group. And so that's basically how we figure out when we do trials to make sure that these trials are done in a fair manner and we, or, or fair testing of the drug. Double-blinded sounds kind of scary, but this means that when you do a double-blinded randomized study, this is when you don't you, the doctor nor the patient knows whether or not they're on the experimental arm or whether they're on the standard arm. And then study phases, phase one studies, we're basically trying to figure out what the best dose is, what's not toxic, um, some hints of effectiveness. Phase two is when we move on to uh, figuring out whether a drug shows some signal for a particular group of individuals. And phase three is when we're actually proving that that drug is useful for that group of individuals. So let's now talk about treatment for metastatic disease in the frontline setting. Um, here is a table, um, which I'm going to all ask you to memorize because I'm going to hand out a quiz after, just kidding. Um, this, is a, this is basically the table of the drugs that are currently available for, for kidney cancer, both in the frontline setting, which I'm going to focus on, you see first-line therapy, and then second-line therapy. And then you see in the second column, there is risk, good or intermediate risk and poor risk. And I'll explain what that means why we're, when we're talking about risk factors. And then I'm going to focus on the approved agents, sunitinib and pazopinib or sutent and votrant. And I'm going to introduce cabometics or cabozantinib um, as, as an experimental agent in the frontline setting. And I'm going to briefly talk about Toracel. So what are risk models? It's not, you know, whether or not, you know, you're, you're, you're acting risky or more or less risky, but it's whether or not your cancer has higher probability of resulting in shorter survival versus longer survival. And so these risk models <clears throat> are statistical creations where you take a couple of different factors. You take things that seem to be associated with better or worse outcome, for example, short time from diagnosis to treatment low hemoglobin, high LDH, high calcium, um, less feeling wellness. And then you put those together and you can come up with these, these, these um, models that say that if you have none of those risk factors, you're going to have the best survival. If you have one to two of any of those risk factors, your survival will be somewhat lower. If you have three or more, it's even lower. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at what are called Kaplan-Meier curves, um, I guess, uh, uh, those, those are the statisticians who develop these. And then you have years from diagnosis, and then you have proportion surviving. So x-axis is years from diagnosis, proportion surviving is the y-axis, and as people pass away, the lines go down. And so you can see, obviously, the blue line is the one that has the best outcome. Again, not great. This was back in the interferon era. 
We have another one that's called the, well, it's called the IMDC, um, or we also call it Heng criteria after Danny Heng, who's a, a wonderful statistician and, and kidney cancer doctor who lives in Canada. Um, and this is a slightly different risk model where we basically take uh, take out LDH, which you saw in the other one, and put in high white count and high platelet count as being other negative risk factors. And here again, you can create these and you can show different survivals as a function of these risks. Okay, so now you guys are experts on um, what, how these drugs work and why when we talk about risk stratification or, 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 or risk um, models, what that means. So some of the key questions we want to ask are once you're diagnosed with metastatic kidney cancer, do you have to start treatment immediately? You heard a, a great talk from Dr. Wood about uh, you know, taking, using surgery to actually render people free of disease. But what about watching and waiting even when you have metastatic disease? Might sound crazy, but uh, let's look at some of the data. Uh, is there a best frontline TKI? And um, you know, with, with all respect to the pharmaceutical companies and, and uh, that, the answer is probably not, although we can take really good drugs and make them work somewhat better for patients. And then I will not ask, is there an ideal sequence after frontline treatment failure? That's what Dr. Tanir is going to talk about. But then I'm also going to talk about mTOR inhibitors, or specifically Toracel a bit. So what about what we call active surveillance? So if you have a patient who's diagnosed who has metastatic disease, can we watch? And so Brian Rennie, one of our colleagues at Cleveland Clinic, des designed this study and took 52 individuals who had asymptomatic mean, they were symptom-free, they didn't have any pain from any of their, their metastatic sites um, and had no prior treatment, and watched them basically every three months and determined how long it would take for them to really need to um, start systemic therapy. Systemic therapy meaning active therapy. And the answer is that it took about uh, uh, 22 months for the good risk, they also then stratified between good, um, good and intermediate and, uh, sorry, good risk patients and then intermediate and poor risk patients. And if you had good risk features, you could wait almost two years before starting therapy in this trial versus um, in the unfavorable group, they had to start sooner because, you know, maybe symptoms of rapid, rapid growth of disease, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that we can do for some individuals. Um, just a slide of the NCCN guidelines. So this is basically a guideline uh, that uh, uh, is formed basically the committee of doctors around the country who basically, you know, say what's the, what's the therapy that we give uh, in, in the frontline setting or, or in the second line setting. And here's kind of a laundry, the, the laundry list and basically it's a set of recommendations for therapies that have some data and we see that pazopinib and sunitinib are category one, and bevacizumab and interferon is also category one, um, and then Toracel or Temsorulimus is category one for poor prognosis patients and category 2B, meaning somewhat lower um, level of, of, of confidence for, for people who don't have poor risk features. And you see high dose IL-2 for selected patients, exitinib and best supportive care. But let's talk about the two that are most commonly used. First of all, sunitinib or sutent. And this is an oral anti-angiogenic or blood vessel starving drug. The official way of giving it is, two, is four weeks on and two weeks off, although we have data that we have presented at GU ASCO and we're going to be presenting at ASCO uh, that show that, that if you give people this drug two weeks on and one week off, it looks like the number of grade four toxicities goes down or higher grade toxicities or side effects goes down. And at least in our small study, it, show, it suggests that people get the opportunity to get a better response and stay on the drug longer and have better survival. So the data are not super duper strong with regards to changing the schedule, but if you ask any oncologist who treats kidney cancer around the country, you're going to find that the majority of them have moved from a four-week on, two-week off schedule to a two-week on, one-week off schedule. So, um, the other drug that we, we give a lot of is, is pazopinib um, or, or Votrient, and I'm going to show some slides about why that drug was approved. But um, Votrient is a, a drug that's also an oral agent, and it's given um, daily, and the standard dose is 800 milligrams per day. That was FDA approved in 2009. Sutent was approved in 2006. And then a study was done comparing them head to head. 
And this study is actually a little bit interesting, and it was called a non-inferiority study. And this has nothing to do with inferiority complexes or anything like this, but it has to do with the design of the trial. This, the hypothesis, whenever we do a trial, we're testing a hypothesis. The hypothesis that was being tested is that Votrientor pazoponib was not inferior to Sutent in previously treated patients. So it was pretty much as good as, is another way of saying it, although more t technically you can't say it was as good as, just that it wasn't inferior to. This was a big study, 1,110 patients that were randomized between Sutent and a four-week on, two-week off schedule versus Votrient in a, in a standard um, 800 milligram schedule. And here again we have those Kaplan-Meier curves. The one on the left are the, is the proportion of people who did not have the disease start growing, and the one on the right is the overall survival curve. And again, you know, over time, time is on the x-axis, the y-axis is then the number of people who are still in that happy state of either not having progressed on the left or are still surviving on the right. And you can see that these two curves, one for the Votrient and one for the Sutent, are pretty much overlapping. All right, so if you have to pick and choose between these two, which one would you choose? Well, it's kind of Coke or Pepsi. It's pretty much the same here, okay? Um, now, the side effect profile for these two agents was somewhat different in that you saw that there was some, and what we have here is um, we, we have what are called um, uh, forest plots, and, and these basically are just sort of showing um, favoring pazopinib or votriant in one direction and favoring sutent in the other direction, and then you have the list of the things that they looked at. And you could see that some things were actually better for sutent. For example, votriant makes your hair turn white, doesn't happen with sutent. Um, weight decrease seems to be more common with votriant, and also votriant irritates the liver more. But then there were some other things that, that sutent did more of. And it did, um, it, it changed the blood count somewhat. It seemed to, to uh, cause uh, taste alterations more. So there were a couple of things that Sutent did that Votrient didn't. Now remember, this is in the four week on, two week off schedule. And you know, we never, we didn't do a follow up 1110 patient study of Sutent in the two week on, one week off schedule compared to Votrient. Probably this would have equaled, equalized out somewhat. And the other thing that's missing from this there's actually a whole, there's a, this is a, a shortened list. There's actually a list of a whole bunch of things that are in between that are actually pretty much the same between the two drugs. So fairly equivalent. So Toracel, now let's talk about that. This is, remember, the mTOR inhibitor. That's taking the gas pedal off, slowing down the cancer cell growth therapy. This is IV given weekly. Um, and it's FDA approved for, in, for advanced kidney cancer in May 2007. And it was FDA approved on the basis of a randomized phase three study between Toracel versus interferon versus interferon plus Toracel. Interferon? Who uses interferon anymore? Not many people. So, you know, this is the, but that was the, the, the drug to beat in, in 2005 or, or so. So this trial demonstrated that in that group of individuals, this group of individuals had poor risk features, okay? Remember the, the memorial, the, 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 those, those risk um, categories that I talked about? And in this poor risk group, Toracel did better. Now, Toracel has not been compared to contemporary agents. And so Dr. Tanir uh, and, and our group have a study that's currently open at MD Anderson where we're comparing um, Toracel to, to Votrient or Pazopinib. So there, we're trying to ask the question of whether in that poor risk group of individuals there are better drugs out there. And so this is a trial that's looking at that in poor risk patients. So let's in the last minute or two talk about cabozantinib or cabomatics. And Dr. Tanir is going to talk about this a fair bit more. This is another pill form therapy. It's an anti-angiogenic or blood vessel starving agent. Uh, it's given 60 milligrams per mouth daily. Uh, you can dose reduce it, which actually, because this drug can cause a fair number of side effects, we often do, and, but you can often find the right dose for people with it. And it was FDA approved for people who had progressed after like Sutent or Votrient or, or therapy, uh, other, um, other drugs like that. So it's now FDA approved in the second line setting, not in the front line setting. But there was a smaller study that was done and that's been published testing whether or not this drug is better than Sutent in the frontline setting. And this was a smaller study. It was about 150 patients. The primary outcome measure was time until disease progression or progression-free survival. And um, 
these patients had either intermediate or poor risk features as well. There weren't any of those good risk patients in here. 80% were intermediate, 20% were poor risk. And um, a lot of words here. Bottom line was that the progression-free survival for Votrin, uh, for, sorry, cabometics was better than sut sunitinib, okay? Um, a couple of things, though. First of all, the sunitinib was given in a four-week-on, two-week-off schedule in this. It was not given in a two-week-on, one-week-off schedule. Number two, um, there were a lot of people who came off the study early on uh, in the sutent arm, but not in the cabometics arm. Kind of suspicious, a little interesting. I mean, not suspicious in that there was any malfeasance, but, you know, you, if you're on a clinical trial and you get on the regular drug, and you're told, well, you're going to get the, you're getting the regular drug, and you're going to have to keep on coming back to, you know, whatever center that you're, you're, you have to come to frequently. You know, some people will say, oh, I don't want to do this. So, so there were a couple of things that were a little bit, you know, um, um, in favor, I guess, of cabometics in this trial. But the bottom line is it still had, cabometics had a better progression-free survival than Sutent. Um, these data are now going in front of the, are being analyzed independently, and we're going to see whether or not, with additional scrutiny, these data stand up and um, cabometics becomes a frontline standard of care for intermediate and poorest patients. We'll see, um, and, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that's going to be the case. So in summary, at this point in time still, Sutent or Sunitinib and Pazofenib or Votrient are the mainstays of therapy uh, in the frontline setting. Um, Toracel or Tempsorilimus um, is basically on the list as an option for poor risk patients. We're getting more drugs that are either being tested against Toracel, like Votrient, um, as well as uh, um, uh, uh, cabometics that are sort of being tested in that poor risk setting, so maybe we're going to have new options for that. And, and the, we don't have enough time to really talk in greater detail about other things that are coming down the pipeline in the poor risk setting. But um, that's essentially the summary. And uh, thank you very much for listening.